Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, or good evening, or whatever time it is where you're watching, but it's morning here. I'm here to talk about referendums and democracy, about a political system that sometimes has been abused, that sometimes has led to what would seem to be silly decisions, which has also, on other occasions, led to decisions that have solved issues, that have created peace, and at other times have done the very opposite. Now, I will start by uh, talking about a number of issues that are covered in a book that I have written myself, humbly, which is called uh, The Referendum and Other Essays on Constitutional Politics. And in this book, um, I will cut, uh, talk about a number of issues. In these lectures, I will talk about a number of issues that have been dealt with in my book. We will, uh, through these lectures, uh, talk about the history of direct democracy, which would involve a fair bit of philosophical research. Now, uh, we would probably cover the likes, thinkers, the likes of Aristotle here, who wrote uh, his book, The Politics, which covers many of these issues. We'll also juxtapose his views with views by people such as Thomas Hobbes, who in Leviathan, this is this very fat book here, uh, talked about how we really should have a system that is the very opposite of direct democracy, that when you have a system of democracy, it automatically leads to chaos. Now, after the first lecture, I will be talking, which will be this one as well, where we'll be talking about the history of, uh, of referendum, the history of direct democracy. We'll then move on to talk about referendums uh, and direct democracy paradoxically in states that are not democracies, how rulers and leaders who are totalitarian or authoritarian leaders or all authoritarian leaders have occasionally appealed to the people and how that is a, a novelty in, in some ways in democratic thinking. We will then move on to talk about a thing called consociationalism, which is how people can have um, shared government, power sharing, like we have in Northern Ireland, uh, where we have systems where people have to come together, have to make compromises, and we'll talk about the philosophy of that as well. Um, we will move on to talk about, um, well, referendums and the consequences of them, but Obviously, there is a, a kind of an elephant in the room when we talk about referendums. A lot of people, especially when they are in the United Kingdom, will talk, talk about the Brexit referendum, how the British people voted to leave the European Union, and, and why they did that, how uh, referendums are determined, how people occasionally uh, vote for uh, the issue, but sometimes also will be driven by other factors. Um, we will then move on to talk about what the system of referendums generally mean. If it is a thing that leads to, to poverty, if people get poorer, if the public services get worse or better as a result of direct democracy. Um, and then um, at, the, at the very end of these lectures we will we'll talk about the, the sort of the what if questions or the what what you know, what's the next move, what would happen in the future, which will be uh, slightly more tricky, I suppose. So, um, without further ado, I would like to start. Now, um, if you are the sort of person who is interested in the history of the ideas, you might know a man called Albert Camus, or Albert Camus, as we sometimes call him in English, but we should use the French name Albert Camus. Albert Camus is famous for a book uh, called The Outside or L'Etrangerie, but he also wrote a book on political philosophy, which is called The Rebel, or in French, L'Homme Révolté. And in L'Homme Révolté, which is written from the 1950s, he talks about the rebel. And he says, the rebel is the man who says no, but whose refusal does not imply renunciation. It is a slave who has taken orders all his life, and suddenly he decides that he cannot obey the command any longer. So what does he say? He says no. There are certain limits beyond which you shall not go. In other words, 
he didn't know of Burns the existence of a borderline. Now that is obviously at a very high philosophical level, and I doubt that most people who were voting in the British Brexit referendum were considering points of political philosophy. But there probably was a sense in which that they felt they had been taken very far, they had had to accept laws and regulations that they didn't really agree with. So at this stage in their life, in 2016, when they voted in the referendum, there was this element of enough is enough. And sometimes a referendum, for better or for worse, is a case of this enough is enough. I was in Italy a few months after the referendum, um, and as is typical for people who, who go into new countries, they get most of the information from the taxi driver. So when I was driving from the airport in Rome uh, into the city, I was talking to the taxi driver. I was there because there was a referendum also taking place in Italy at that time. A referendum on, on the constitution. Matteo Renzi, the Italian prime minister, wanted a new constitution, one that arguably would give more power to him, but it was sold as a, as a little exercise of just tidy up an otherwise quite untidy constitution. So, um, when I was talking to the taxi driver, um, I, he was trying to sort of convey why he was opposed to this. He said, well, he quite liked Renzi. He, was a, he, he thought he was a good politician. He thought it was good to, to get a new kind of politician after many years with Silvio Berlusconi, uh, who had not necessarily done that many great things for Italy. But he says, well, I'm not happy to just be driven along sort of purged headlong into a future that I may not agree with. And there comes a time when you just have to say no. So basically he was saying the same thing as Elvia Penny. And he said, I don't know how to say this in English, but in Italian it's called basta non più, up to this point and no more. Finally and no more. Obviously, I think for a non-Italian, uh, most Italian words sound a little bit better. But there is an element of this basta non più in uh, all talks about referendums. And how's, how's that? Why is that? Um, well, the referendum as a political institution is an institution that allows people to say no. It is a uh, constitutional theorist called Albert Venn Dicey uh, said, uh, or Dicey is known as Dicey, he's... Uh, was the British constitutional lawyer who introduced the, the concept of the sovereignty of Parliament. He also wrote about referendums around 1900, and he says the referendum is a people's veto. It is when you have really fundamental issues that are passing into law, then the people, who is now the ultimate sovereign, should be allowed to say no. It doesn't allow them to do all sorts of other things. It's not a... a new kind of political system that will um, that will take power to the people is still representative government but it's just in cases that where the representatives don't really have a mandate they can then uh, they will then be asked um, in a referendum to say no so in other words the referendum is the people's veto and which is one of the things we will be be talking about uh, in uh, in this book. Now, I would like to, uh, for those of you who may have um, have looked at my book, which uh, of course you're free to do, um, I would like to talk a little bit about the history. Now, uh, and this will probably require some of you to, um, to to read up on this subject. We are a university after all, and it is, there's nothing wrong about uh, reading. Uh, but also, as a, as a part of this, as part of this course, the way it will be taught uh, is that we won't just be looking at sort of statistics and all of that. We'll use that as well. Now, the idea of, uh, of, of this course, the idea of my book, is that we combine a number of different approaches to understanding this phenomenon, which is the referendum, this phenomenon, which is democracy, and more generally, the phenomenon that is called politics. We see politics as a cultural endeavour, and as a cultural endeavour, a cultural um, fact 
think of Amy Durkheim, the great French sociologist, talked about social facts. We're not just looking at these facts, but we look, are looking at a thing which is also a fact. And in order to understand this, we need to draw on a number of different perspectives. We need to draw on history, we need to draw on philosophy, and to a degree we even need to draw on classical writers such as Cicero and, and all the rest of them. Because democracy is you know, a deep part of, um, of European civilization or Western civilization, if you like. Democracy, I should say, uh, from the outset, uh, democracy is a funny kind of political system. It is a political system which is based on the idea that every person uh, may bring something to the table. That every person, even if they're not philosophers, even if they're not great thinkers or statesmen or anything, may be able to say, but wait a minute, there is something there I don't really like. Now, I would like, when we, when we talk about that, to take this book by Aristotle, The Politics, or Politica, uh, as it's called. Aristotle um, lived, uh, you know, 2,200 years ago, uh, or actually a little bit more, if, if, if I'm correct, uh, and he was a Macedonian thinker who was living in, in Athens. He was a student of Plato, the, the, one of the, the first philosopher, if you like. And unlike Plato, who was thinking sort of very great thoughts at a very abstract level, Aristotle based his political philosophy, his philosophy more generally. He was the founder of zoology, psychology, uh, physics, uh, and political science, of, you know, quite an overachiever. But in his work, he was an empirical thinker. He also worked for a while for Alexander the Great, uh, and he collected constitutions from different parts of the world. He then divide, uh, divided these countries into monarchies that are ruled by one man, oligarchies that are ruled by, by a few men, and then democracies which are ruled by everyone. Uh, and then he said they were also there were good sides and bad sides to that. So a monarchy, for example, can be ruled by a wise and clever man who uh, is interested in, in the well-being of the citizens, but he can also be ruled by a tyrant. Uh, the same with an, an, an oligarchy can also be, uh, let's say if it's negative, but if it's positive, it's an aristocracy. Uh, a democracy can be well ruled, but it can also be constitutional government. And at the end of the day, he thought constitutional government was the best system because, and this is what he says in the book, a meal that has been pre prepared by many people is better than one which is just provided for one individual. It might be this individual is a, is a wonderful uh, cook who can, who can just put it all together, who's got all these, these abilities. But if you actually have many people who bring things to the table, then you're more likely to have a better meal. Um, so he says basically the wisdom of the many, the, it's also known as the wisdom of the crowd, will collectively be greater than the wisdom of one individual. Interestingly, at the time when Aristotle wrote this in, in the politics, um, the same thing was a Chinese saying which says that three stupid shoemakers know more than the wisest man. So this idea of three stupid shoemakers know more than the wisest man is the idea of, of democracy. It is in some ways also the idea of, of Western civilization. In, in some ways, in a roundabout way, and I'm exaggerating now, in a roundabout way democracy is almost synonymous with the best that we have in Western civilization. And the best we have in Western civilization and European civilization is not a system that says we're much better than you are. In fact, it is the very opposite. Western civilization is based on, on the idea that we don't know if we're right. We're not sure that we're right. And therefore, we need to debate things with other people. We need to be open to the views of other people. That's the thing that sort of permeates Western civilization at its best. It's never dictated, it's never preaching, saying, you have to do this. This is the only thing that you can have. You have to do this. This is the best thing you have to do. Now, Western civilization is based on, on what's known as Socratic dialogue. Socrates, who was the first major Western thinker, did not just tell people what to do. Now, you would have 
in many old texts where you have individuals who say, well, you must do this, you must do that. But Socrates had debates with people. He was open to people. If you read his dialogues, yes, the occasional, he does ask uh, rhetorical questions. But the, especially the early dialogue was based on this idea that you have a discussion and then you learn things. You, know, you have different arguments that sort of rob against each other and then the, the truth springs out, which is one of the, the metaphors that, uh, that Socrates uses. Now, if we then sort of go fast forward in, in history, through Aristotle, who talks about all these different ideas coming together, up to the Renaissance, we had the likes of Machiavelli, the great Italian thinker who's notorious for talking about the prince, but also in most of his other writings, talks about how the people can ex exercise a veto over the leaders, because collectively they know more. He doesn't reference Aristotle, he must have read Aristotle, but it's the same idea. Roughly at the same time, René Descartes, the great French mathematician and philosopher, says the fundamental idea of philosophy is that you have to doubt everything, which then goes on to the, the likes of, of John Stuart Mill a little bit later, who is adamant that you can only create a good society if you allow all these different opinions to be voiced. And these different opinions um, are more likely to be voiced in a democracy. Because in a democracy, people would be able to say, wait a minute, government, we don't really like what you're doing. You should think again. Now, when you have um, these political systems, you might say, well, yes, but occasionally you have a majority government. The John Stuart Mill, whom I just mentioned, but, but also to a degree um, Aristotle, talk about systems where you have to allow the minorities into government. Now, Aristotle wasn't uh, talking about different electoral systems. They frankly had not been invented, but John Stuart Mill was able to do so in the uh, uh, 19th century. Uh, he talked about proportional representation. This can be extremely technical when you, when you go into details, and, and I'd urge you to read up about uh, this. We'll, we'll get back to that in, in, uh, later when we're talking about these issues. Well, one of the things that John Stuart Mill said was we need to have an electoral system that ensures that the government can't just tyrannise the minority. You can't have tyranny of the majority. Now, a democratic system is better than a dictatorial system, according to Mill, because you can unseat the government. In a dictatorial government, or in a democratic government, you have rulers who cannot learn from their well, they're unlikely to learn from their mistakes. And certainly, people are not able to say when the government has made mistakes. Because if you criticise the government, then you're likely to end up in places where you'd rather not be, either in a gulag or in a concentration camp, or just be locked away. We have many examples of that uh, throughout the world. You have places where people recently, during the coronavirus, said that people should be wearing face masks. There was a case in China about that. And the doctor who said that was then hurled before a court and um, asked to, or forced to renounce these um, obstructionist views, these, um, this, this heresy that the government could do something wrong. And because this particular government, the Chinese government, did not allow people freedom of speech, because they do not believe in democracy, many people died as a result of that. Trillions of dollars have been lost because freedom of speech is not there. So it's a very concrete example of the fact that people should be allowed to say, wait a minute. So that is the idea of democracy. So like, if we then take sort of like the, the long uh, view of Western civilization, if you like, then democracy is very much at, at the heart of it. Now, of course, there are many thinkers who, who were less than enamoured by the idea of democracy and the, the way that democracy is practised will, will differ in, in different places. But when, again, when we are talking about democracy, we should probably say that when we define democracy, it has only really existed in the past 200 years. And the most important event the most important thing that happened during those 200 years was the inaugural fact of the French Revolution. 
Some people will say that the American Revolution before that was equally important, and, and in many ways that is probably true. But at that stage, in, in 1789, America was a small colony, very far away, where they, yes, they were experimenting uh, with democracy. The founding fathers, and we will come back to them uh, later on, in fact there will be, in addition to these lectures, there will be a lecture on uh, the founding of the American uh, Republic, which will look at the Federalist Papers and the ideas that shaped uh, the American Revolution. It's one of the things we, we will talk about uh, in that particular lecture, is how the American Revolution was inspired by, by the Romans, by the Greeks, and to a degree French thinkers, how the American system was really open, and how openness was part of, um, of the democratic system of government. Instead of closed, you're always open to new ideas. So that's something we'll come back to later. But for, for, for practice, for all intents and purposes, the spirit of democracy, the idea of democracy, grew out of the French Revolution. It was also at that time that the idea of constitutionalism became part of, uh, of, of, of the political system. Now, again, I have mentioned Charles de Gaulle, who is this uh, gentleman here. He was the French president in, uh, in the early 1960s. Now, uh, he was not always incredibly democratic. He had a background as a military man. He was also leader of the Free French during the Second World War. Uh, but he was also a bookish thinker. He's often referred to as uh, General de Gaulle or General de Gaulle. Uh, and yes, he did have the rank of a general. But his, his day job, really, was to be a lecturer in military history at the French uh, Military Academy. So he was more bookish than he was um, sort of combative. He, he didn't really earn his stripes uh, fundamentally as a, uh, in the trenches and and fighting like General Patton or, or, or somebody like that. He was, he was a, a thinker more than or as much as he was a fighter. And when he was asked about the, uh, the law and democracy, he, he tried to sort of sum it up uh, in, his, um, in, a sort of, in, in his shorthand. And he says, the Constitution is a practice it is institutions, and it is a spirit. Uh, so, en pratique, des institutions et l'esprit. Uh, the French are always, and I think that's, that's a wonderful thing, uh, always keen to talk about l'esprit, or the spirit of a thing. And I think the spirit of democracy is extremely important. But it is also important to talk about the other two things, uh, des institutions, the institutions, and the practice, uh, and then we get on to, to the spirit. So when, in these lectures, we're going to talk about uh, referendums, it is important that we know what we mean by the institutions. Uh, so in what follows here will be, if you like, the sort of, uh, perhaps less exciting things, but we need to get this over with. And, and we need to, and this is an important point, actually, from a research point of view, you always need to be very clear about the definitions of the terms that you're using. Um, when there's a lack of clarity about the institutions, there'll be lack of clarity about uh, what we're talking about, and then we may end up talk, in talking cross-purposes. So we need to know what we're talking about. In Latin, there's a phrase which is called digostibus non est disputandum, which is basically the fundamentals are not uh, debatable. Uh, when we define a thing that is de and it is defined in this particular way, uh, and we use that uh, throughout afterwards. Whether that is a true definition is a different matter. Philosophers uh, talk about a thing called uh, nominalism versus universalism. And nominalism is the idea that words just mean a particular thing, and but they, they don't have any sort of metaphysical meaning, if you want to be sort of highbrow about it. Whereas the universalists say there's one definition, and that is the definition, and it cannot be changed. And we won't be using that here. We'll just put, use it for practical purposes. We'll be defining referendums, plebiscites, and so on, in a particular way. So we are taking, if you like, a nominalist approach. But that's just for methodological purposes. We're not making a philosophical point here. Um, so 
talk about the the institution, this institution, uh, the referendum, uh, which is the, the core of the election, uh, can generally be seen as a as a popular vote, a vote by by all the people, the people who are eligible to vote, uh, on a policy issue. So that's all right. The overall uh, encompassing uh, definition of it, for practical purposes, for among political scientists, a referendum is not just a vote. It is a vote uh, that is not uh, proposed by the people. So a referendum is a veto. It is a veto uh, that can exist in different ways. Sometimes you can have a veto as part of the constitution. That's what you have in Ireland. In Ireland there used to be a ban on, on abortion in the constitution. In order to change that, in order to allow uh, abortion into, into Ireland, you needed to change the constitution and that could only be done by a referendum. So to use a technical term, the Irish constitution was entrenched. Uh, there was an entrenchment of the constitution that meant that in order to introduce certain types of legislation, you need to, to change the, the constitution. So that's a constitutional referendum. But in some other countries, you have systems that allow the people to demand referendums on, on issues that uh, they, they deem to be in need of a referendum. For example, in Italy, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, the then Prime Minister Berlusconi was, um, was being charged with, with, um, with fraud, essentially, and he then introduced a law in the Italian Parliament that was passed that would give him immunity from prosecution. Now, a lot of people in Italy did not like that. So in the Italian constitution, there is a provision that allows people, if they can gather half a million signatures, to have a referendum on an already in, uh, enacted law. That's known as uh, the, the abrogative referendum or the popular referendum. The, the Italian term is the il referendum abrogativo. Uh, but you also have that in Switzerland where uh, people can demand a referendum on an already enacted law or, or before it becomes law. Uh, it's slight, slight difference there. Uh, so before it comes into effect, the Switzerland in, in Italy it has already come into effect when you when you ban it. Uh, in Switzerland, they have, uh, by the way, there's like the, the the world center of direct democracy, for instance, which we'll come back to shortly. Uh, they have referendums all the time. They have uh, between uh, five and sixteen referendums every year. On three or to four occasions every year, you have referendums. Uh, and those are mostly these referendums where the people have initiated themselves on laws that they don't like. So those abrogative referendums is a, an alternative way of having a people's veto. So we are also have so we have constitutional referendums, but you can only change the constitution if you if you have a referendum. You can have abrogative referendums, which are referendums on on uh, on issues that the people have demanded. So those are popular referendums. You can also have, uh, and this is sort of slightly taking a bit further, a thing called the initiative. The initiative is, if you like, sort of like a turbocharged version of the referendum. The referendum is a veto. The initiative is something else. It is the people are given the right to propose legislation. They can say, well, but you politicians have not done anything on this particular thing. We want to have a law that introduces this particular thing. So in, in several countries, you um, mostly in, uh, in Eastern Europe, but also in a number of American states, uh, literally half of, uh, of the 50 American states have provisions for the initiative, which allows people to demand that le legislation is introduced, and then they can gather signatures and they'll get a vote. Uh, and if it is within the, the constitution, you can then change the constitution to that effect. Uh, so in, in some American states, uh, they have introduced gay marriage or marriage equality as a result of, of that. In other states, they've actually done the opposite. So referendum can sometimes be conservative, it can sometimes be progressive. Uh, that's a different matter. So again, to sum up, um, um, so far among the institutions, we have referendums, which are two types. We can have abrogative referendums on laws that are already enacted, which people initiate. Then you can have constitutional referendums, which happen 
should happen more or less automatically when you want to change the constitution. Then you have initiative where people don't just vote on a thing, don't just allow themselves a veto, they don't have a veto over legislation, but actually propose legislation. And then we have a third category, which is referendums uh, that are called by the government. Now, these referendums are sometimes known as plebiscites. That's a, an old uh, Italian or Roman word back in the day in the Roman Republic, which broke down when Caesar crossed the Rubicon in, in 49 um, BC, uh, and the Roman system became undemocratic and authoritarian. But until that time, the Romans had a system where the people, plebs, uh, could vote on things, uh, and hence they were known as plebiscites. But the original kind of plebiscite, if you like, was quite a democratic thing. But in modern times, the plebiscite has um, become rather negative. It is a system whereby typically an authoritarian leader will demand a referendum on a, on a particular thing. He sort of seeks affirmation. It is interesting that the likes of Mussolini, Hitler, Ayatollah Khomeini, Muhammad Gaddafi, and, and, and basically you name them, many of these leaders have proposed refer oh, plebiscites where they say, well, you should vote on this, but there really is no alternative. Um, in, in France in 1850, Napoleon III, who was a nephew of, uh, of Napoleon Bonaparte, um, proposed a referendum on whether he should stay in power. And the only option really was, yes, you can vote no. So it's, it's an affirmation of that. But there can also be, in democratic countries, where democratic government can use, or should I say, abuse the referendum. When they're in a tight spot and they know that there's an issue they don't really want to deal with, then they can sort of kick it out to, to the people. They can say, we, can, we will have a, a vote on this, and then it's, 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 it's over and, and, and done with. And in the United Kingdom, uh, we've often seen, though of course our referendums here are, are democratic, they're regulated, they are, um, we, we have limits on campaign spending, which many countries don't have. But the idea of the referendum is not really fundamentally to have a veto, it is to solve a practical political issue. The Labour Party back in the in the 1970s couldn't agree with themselves over over the e, EEC, which is you know the, the precursor of the EU. Uh, the party was split, and they decided to to have a referendum on it. Let the people decide, which was sort of a way of chickening out. Uh, so we'll just uh, the only way we can maintain unity is by having this vote, which is a plebiscary like. When the coalition government, the Conservative-led government, came in with the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives in 2010, they couldn't agree on the electoral system. So once again, they kicked it out to the people to decide. And then, uh, famously or infamously, when David Cameron uh, had a problem with the Conservative backbenchers and he felt he was threatened by the United Kingdom Independence Party and UKIP, he said, well, we'll just have a referendum on EU membership, which, of course, uh, went... Um, against what he uh, had, uh, had wished for. So those last types of, uh, these types of referendums uh, are what we normally define as plebiscitary referendums or plebiscites. So we have overall a number of different types of referendums. We have referendums proper, which can be either called by the people or they can be constitutional referendums. We have initiatives, which are demanded by the people where they propose uh, new legislation, which if they vote for that, will come into effect. And then we have plebiscites or plebiscitary referendums, which are referendums that are called by governments so they can get out of a tight spot, which may not necessarily be uh, that democratic uh, as uh, referendums. Um, again, I said something about the, the French Revolution. And it's interesting when you go back to the French Revolution, now we have sort of defined the, the institutions of this, we can then now talk about perhaps the practice of democracy. And it's interesting at the time of the French Revolution, uh, a number of smaller states uh, around France uh, uh, that were actually ruled by, um, by the Pope, such as Avignon, uh, wanted to join France. And at that time, 
Carlo Lencinocco, who uh, um, was a, uh, a cardinal, wrote a note to the Pope. Um, and, uh, and he was most alarmed because they were going to have these referendums in, uh, among other places, Avignon. And um, he uh, was, um, as I said, um, against this idea of what he said this manifest violation of the law of law of nations as a result of the outbreak of democracy. Um, he then also goes on to say that the logical consequence of all of this would be that the people will be decide will be able to choose their own ruler. The people will be able to choose their own ruler. And then there's a little bit of a a gap if you like, in the, in the dispatch of the Exende, in the letter of his writing, a little bit of like a, a, as if he was sort of forced to thought. And then he writes another word, absurd. So in 1791, the idea that people could choose their own ruler, they could choose what kind of system of government they wanted to live under, was defined as absurd. Now, Nowadays, and after that, it of course became sort of the gold standard of everything, is that it would even be followed by dictators, that the people, of course, have the right to define their system of government, to choose the system of government that they want to live under, and to say that that is absurd, is in fact absurd for us. But for a cardinal, a man of the Catholic Church writing at that time, there are probably many reasons why um, he, he was so concerned about this. Obviously, he was of a conservative disposition. Um, the referendum they were being held in, in, uh, in Avignon um, were about national self-determination. We've had many of those referendums subsequent to, to that. But these referendums were were just sort of um, the hors d'oeuvre, the, the, sort of the, the starter, really, for, for a, a, a general tendency that happened at the time. Uh, there's a French mathematician called Condorcet, who was known for cyclical voting and very technical things in, in sort of the, the mathematics of politics, if you like. He was also the man who drew up uh, the uh, 1793 constitution in France. And the 1793 Constitution of France was an incredibly radical document. Condorcet had already written a book where he says the people should be given the right to veto legislation. Um, and this right to veto legislation meant that the whole Constitution, the 1793 Constitution, had to be submitted to the people. And it was submitted to the people, and they voted on it. And apparently it was a relatively fair vote. And afterwards, the... the, 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 the revolution collapsed and we had everyone bird writing about how, how it went from bad to worse and in the end Napoleon came in and, uh, and took over uh, when he took over by the way he submitted that decision to a plebiscite do you want me to rule uh, pretty much forever he had a series of plebiscites actually Napoleon but he wanted the people to sanction that but if we just go back to the 1793 uh, constitution in France then it was an incredible, incredibly radical document for the time. It allowed Jewish people to become citizens. It legalized homosexuality. So the ideas of the Enlightenment were sort of embedded into this first constitution and the people voted for that. So when direct democracy started in France, it started with an affirmation of the ideals of the Enlightenment, if you like, even the ideals of Western civilization, as I see them. You know, that openness, that tolerance, that acceptance that in any society you should allow minority groups to have rights as well. Now, the flip side of that is that only less than a decade later, a dictator took over. So sometimes, obviously, the direct democracy can perhaps be taken too far. But the fundamental thing about direct democracy, about referendums, when the whole thing started off in the 1790s, 
where it says you should give people responsibility. You should give people responsibility to make decisions for their own lives. And this idea was based on the assumption that we can never quite be sure that we're right. That in any system of democracy, it might be that the people will know a thing that their rulers cannot see. And the rulers and the, 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 the elected leaders or, or whoever the leaders may be may be experts and may have, devoted, have devoted their entire lives to, to politics. And they may know a great number of things that ordinary people do not know. But there are always little issues that people will say, hey, wait a minute, that doesn't quite work. And there's also a right for people to, to maybe have a say, maybe be allowed to say, as the Italian taxi driver said to me, that's the non view up to this point and no further. Sometimes maybe we have to wait. Sometimes things have to mature before they can be put into action. Maybe sometimes we're a bit unsure of how fast things should be allowed to progress or how quickly things should be allowed to come into place. And that's where the referendum is. Not just to be sort of conservative with a small c, for just because we want to be conservative, but because sometimes an element of conservatism, just as an element of, uh, of the opposite of, of of liberalism or being progressive is necessary. Sometimes they have to be balanced. And the referendum can be that balancing act. And that's a thing that people have talked about throughout history, but certainly in the West. Tacitus, who was a great Roman historian, wrote about Germania. He was uh, one of the first historians to, to use sources and to use comparative history. And he talked about the system that existed in Northern Europe, where he said, in Northern Europe, the smaller decisions are made by the chieftains, by the rulers, but on great matters, the people decide. This is the conclusion of the first lecture. I'm looking forward to seeing you again. Thank you.